Hard Rockology show. Chris, Matt, and Jason back with you. That's Hell's Addiction. The song is called Let the Good Times Roll. The single from the band's latest release, Raise Your Glass. And on our phone line, Luke Morley and Liam Sarger from the band. Guys, welcome to the Hard Rockology show. Hey, guys. How are you doing? Yeah. Doing great, guys. So I want to say thanks for uh, joining us. We know it's late over there in, uh, in England. So I have to ask you. Hell's Addiction, Raise Your Glass. I know you guys have only been together for a couple of years now, so how did this album come together so quickly? Everything came together pretty quickly. I mean, we, we, we sort of played in previous bands. A couple of us have played together. Me and Luke have played together in a previous band. Um, I played with Jason, the bass player, in, a, in another band. And they kind of just sort of ran the course. And um, Jason gave me a phone call one day and said, no, I want to put a rock band together. I was like, okay. So I said, I'll have a word with my brother because he plays guitar as well. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll rope Luke in, and we just got in a room. And my brother turned around and said, "I want to have a go at singing," because he never sang before. He, you know, he only played guitar. He played in sort of a, a backup guitarist, um, and he started singing. And we were all like, "Jesus Christ, where, where did that come from?" Yeah, where did that voice come from? <laughs> and, and that was that. And then we wrote. We, I think we wrote "Let the Good Times Roll" in the first. Let the Good Times Roll and breaking through. Like patiently wrote in the first kind of practice. Yeah, in the first practice, and he just went from there. And we thought, you know, let's let's try and get in the studio and. And really get a, gra- a grasp for the sound because when you when you're bashing it out in a room, you kind of know what you sound like. But until you put something down solid, you don't really get the the, the actual idea. So we went in. I think we recorded three tracks. We recorded it was like rock and roll. Yeah, raise your glass and Wings of an Angel. Wings of an Angel the first time, and we were like, wow, this sounds pretty good. So we booked back in and and we went and we did another seven tracks, I think, didn't we? Seven, yeah. And 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 finished the album in, in in sort of no time. And then we were like, well, what do we do with it now? <laughs> So we just we just put it together and, and and sort of set it all up and released it all ourselves. So you guys, do you guys have a studio lined up? I mean, is it pretty expensive to record and stuff over there? Because we've talked about a, a talked to a few other bands in the UK, and they always mention that it's uh, pretty expensive to record or get it right. I mean, so do you guys have a, a, a studio set up already, or you know somebody? No, it, it, it is expensive. Yeah, we, I mean, the, the first album was was self financed. I, mean, I think we went in. Over a period of three times, didn't we? Three recording sessions completely on it, three different weekends. Yeah, I mean, we got it We got it down pretty quickly. I mean, it, we sort of hashed it all out in, in the rehearsal room and, and got everything pretty tight, and everything went down quite quick, didn't it? It helped with the producer. You know, yeah. yeah, got us to the right click. Yeah, sure. Drilled it into us. Yeah. Threw it into me, should I say. Yeah. Sean, Sean, like the producer, a great producer, great studio, and um, Prism Studios, the studio was cool. Excellent live room. The drum sound and the, the guitar, the guitar sounds is, is absolutely fabulous. He predominantly records rock and metal, and um, and you can tell. You know, I've been in a, a few other studios, and you just can't get that sound. And the, his live room is absolutely amazing, and it, it just worked really well for us. Yeah, yeah. So it was good. It was a good experience. Really good experience. Yeah, I have to say, thank you guys, because you guys make me feel, my brother included, about 30 years younger. Yeah, we're back in 1983 now. Yeah, that, that album's got a, a, a sound very reminiscent to, you know, kind of like the L.A. scene that was going on in 83, mixed with a little bit of the new wave of British heavy metal, the sound and everything. Was that something you guys were going for? I think it's all of our influences coming in together. Yeah, we keep, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the reviews, what, what I keep seeing in the reviews, which I think is really cool, is it, it says that we tend to bridge the gap between or hair metal a new wave of British heavy metal which I quite like you know because I like a lot of the sort of sunset strip bands and, and, and that sort of thing but I don't think you know we don't particularly look that way we don't particularly look to be like a, a glammy type of band or anything like that there's a little bit of that in there and then there's a little bit of stuff like Saxon and things like that in there as well so you know it's a bit contradictory really but it's, it's good and, you know, I, I think it's, it's almost a, a new type of sound so everything, everything we look about music I think what it gets a lot of our influences and stuff that we love just with the, the bands together yeah, the platform to just be able to do that and get and play all the songs you love and I think it just shows through shows that what we all love the music the type of scenes where it's all come from around it's like Liam said piece of things together yeah you guys did a great you guys did a great job blending that sound from yeah, from, like, from like, you, like you just said, he bridged the gap, and, and that's the best way to describe it, because you get a little bit of the new wave of British heavy metal, like you mentioned, bands like Saxon, Tigers of Pang Tang, and you mix that in with a little bit of Motley Crue, uh, Quiet Riot, yeah. maybe, um, all those early yeah. um, strip bands from the Sunset Strip, like in 81, 82, and then everything went to hell by 84, so this is like... 1980, 1983, right here. So this is a really great sounding album, and like my brother said, I feel like I was thrown back into time, especially on that one song, "Brand New Story." I really like the guitar solo on that. Can you tell us a little, yeah. little bit about that song? Um, we tried to write that as a ballad. 
Yeah, we, well, I mean, because everything, so the, the tempo of the album is, is just bang, bang, bang. You know, it's, it's such a solid sort of 33, 34 minutes of you put it on, it, you, it, you crack straight through, and it's like, well, that's, that, you know, it's like an appetite for destruction. That's a rock and roll record. That is like, that is just a rock record. So we thought, do we need a ballad? And we kind of, mm, we, we undernawed. So we wrote, which is the closest thing you'll probably ever get to. <laughs> 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 this is how it ended up. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear it from the uh, initial guitar and you know, the delays with, uh, on it and that. Sounds like it's going to be a ballad. And then, unfortunately, me playing drums was just that to fit the tempo. Of it, yeah, and the chorus comes in a rich yeah. face off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned something. The album does come in just under 35 minutes, which is reminiscent to a lot of the band's and the albums that were being put out in the 70s and into the 80s. Yep. Was that something that you guys wanted to do? I mean, not intentionally, but it was just something that, hey, we just let's put everything out there, and let's make this as, as tight and, as, and, and compact as we can and just release this thing. I mean... Yeah, so- definitely. I mean, I mean, for me, uh, an album is just a statement of, of, what, of where the band is at, at, that, at that time period. You know, you wrote those songs, put them out, get yeah. them out, play them, come back, put some more down, get them out, play them, tour them. You know, I mean... Years and years ago, you get people like Ted Nugent and people like that whacking two, two or three albums out a year, and I, I don't understand why bands are sticking an album out and then spending, you know, obviously it's record companies and, and pressure. They're going around touring it for five years, making loads of money off it. But I, I like to think that you can, you know, you get into music because you love writing music and you constantly keep progressing. And I just think an album is, is like a timepiece of where, like, of where you are at that time, and um, and then obviously you, you keep playing those songs. And you progress them a bit live, I suppose, but they never really particularly change. I, I'm not one of these bands, you know, some of these bands where, oh, you know, that we recorded that album 20 years ago and it was a great album. If we could record it now, it sounds so much better. I don't think that's what it's what it's all about. I think it's it's where you are at the time, and you just whack it down and 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 you and then you move on, you progress and you, and you do the next one. And for me, I, I'd get as much out there as I possibly could and keep going out and touring it. And I think you know, if bands like your music, they deserve it as well. So would you say that uh, Hell's Addiction is probably going to go the route, maybe like what Skid Row's doing, Driving and Crying, and even The Cult to some extent, where they're just releasing some EPs with maybe four or five tracks, because at that time, that's what they're recording and that's what they want to get out? Do you think maybe that's a direction you guys may want to go in? Um, no, I think, I think for me, I think a 10-track album is it's just a, you know, 30, 35 minutes of good, solid music. Is, is perfect. You know, you go over the 45, 50 minute mark, 13, 14, 15, 16 tracks, all of a sudden, you know, people are getting to eight or nine tracks and, and, and they're turning it off. So, I, I wanted to have an easy album that people could listen to over and over again. Yeah. Because it's so it's quick, it's in your face, and you want to go back and listen to it again to yeah. really hear the in music. Don't, don't give people a chance to get bored. No. I think that's, that's the idea. Plus, you guys got the perfect amount of songs on the record, 10. Anything over 10, for me, it starts, like you just said, I started going, well, there's too much music to digest, so this is 10, it's a quick 35 minutes, and it's perfect. And you got that one song on there, like we just mentioned, Brand New Story, which kind of breaks up the tempo a little bit. Yeah, yeah, very slightly. I mean, I, I don't think, um, you know, there, there might be one of those on each record, but there certainly won't be any more than one, I wouldn't think. <laughs> So I have to ask you, did you get the uh, big bitch off the couch, or is she still in the house? <laughs> I think we all know one. I think we've all got one somewhere down the line. They're all still in the house as well. Yeah. And then going out. That, that, sound, that sounds like it'll be like a, the ultimate concert song when you guys play that, right? It, it seems to come into its own life, yeah. Yeah, when we, when we first wrote it, we were, we were just sort of pissing around with it, and it, <laughs> and it sounded funny when we were uh, doing it, when we first started jamming the song out. And then I think... The more we played it live, people have really picked up on the big bits in the chorus. You know, shouting that back at us, it's become a lot more anthemic, and you can sort of then, yeah. then imagine it on a, you know, sort of like a massive stage, the whole crowd cheer, uh, shouting it back at you. Yeah, definitely well. Of course, you have to have the big bitches on the stage with you dancing, right? Of course, yeah, yeah without a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> All right, have, having not had a chance to see you guys live, what, what's your closing song? What's your encore song when you guys are playing? Is, is there a track off the album? Or a track maybe that's not on the album that that you play to close out your shows. I think alcohol has become the new yeah track. yeah alcohol yeah a lot more people know that and a lot of people want to sing all the words along to it and that so yeah gives it a lot more and it's a really energetic song to finish the night off especially when everyone's been drinking alcohol and it's a drink it really is a drinking album to be honest yeah. or it's like you say it makes you feel 30, 30 years younger and it makes your car go sixty mile an hour faster as well when you play it in there. <laughs> we had, we actually had both of those problems, but unfortunately, it's only like um, twelve in the afternoon right now in California. So, 
I wasn't ready to crack open a cold one just yet, but we did drive a little <laughs> bit faster on the car on the way over here listening to it. Yeah, so I'd say our cold probably is probably the same, isn't it? That's, that's the closer at the moment. So you guys have actually had a chance to, to, to support some bands, actually some up-and-coming bands, Heaven's Basement, Voodoo, Voodoo Six. Six. Two of those bands are actually some of my favorite bands right now. So what was it like playing with those two guys? Um, it was cool. It was cool. I mean, I, at the team, it was it was a little while ago now, so they, they were just sort of making their way in the scene, so to speak. So, you know, they, obviously they, they, were far, they were far better known than us, and they, they got some decent sort of magazine coverage and, and, and various things. I mean, sort of Voodoo Six had been out with uh, Iron Maiden, I think, previously, and and Heaven's Basement. I mean, they, they've they been knocking around as various different formations for the last 10 years. I've known about them, to be quite honest. And, um, you know, they've, they've, they've played some great shows in their own right. So, yeah, it was, not, it was nice to share the stage with um, with some sort of experienced... experienced and, and, and they're only sort of young bands, but experienced bands. And, and they were very good as well. I, I have to ask, because is there a rhyme or reason? Because just like here in the States, there's some bands that are getting signed that are, that are becoming bigger and getting promoted it's the same thing going on i'm assuming the same thing's going over there over on i guess going on over there in the uk as well is there any rhyme or reason or is it frustrating i guess to be an up-and-coming band and and trying to figure out what it is that you need to do or or what it is that's that's being signed and picked up and distributed i mean or is it just all who you know i think it it, it is a lot of that i mean that certainly helps i mean it's one of those businesses that no matter how great your product is if you can't get it into the right hands or you, you can't get it to the right station or, or, or various different things like that, you know, then nobody's really going to hear it. You, you have to have that, that certain amount of promotion to be able to put it out in front of people. Um, and, you know, if somebody's in the right place that knows the right people and, and can do that for you, then, then great. You know, that's, I think that is half the battle. But, um, you know, I think you've also got to be good enough as well. You, you songs, your songs have got to be good. You've got to be a good live band. You're not passionate as well. Yeah, you know, it's, it's not it's what not, it's not, and like ACD says, a long way to the top. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not one of those things, you know, you can do it and think, I'm going to be in a rock band and, and we're going to get signed and it happens in three months because it don't, it really don't, you know. And if it does, then, then you've done a great job and you've been very lucky, but, yeah. It's 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 pushing and starving. More. Absolutely, yeah. Keep gigging, keep playing the music. Yeah. Okay, guys, here's a question for both of you. The uh, musician you would love to play with live on one song, Living or Dead, and the song that you'd want to play with them. I know who you're going to say. I've been a musician I'd like to play with Zach Wilde. I love uh, Beyond the Drums, Beyond Zach Wilde. one of his uh, many songs, any songs of his, really. Yeah. Um, well, for me, it goes, goes further back, I suppose. Uh, ooh. I don't know. I'd, li- I'd, like to, I'd like to jam with Paul Kossoff from, from Free. Um, some of the guys from the Norman Brothers. I mean, I, I, like, I like stuff that goes, like some of the old blues stuff that goes, goes really far back as well. Dying Back is another one for, for a, modern, a modern day sort of influence. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a massive Pantera yeah, fan, aren't you? Big Pantera fan. Yeah. Pretty awesome guitarist. One of the few, sort of like a sort of Hendrix style, really. Just do. And um, Eva Cassidy just to stand there on stage and watch you sing and just go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting choices, huh, Matt? Yeah, I'd have to agree yeah. with you. I mean, it, it's nice to see that you're going back to, to Free and, some, and, and the Allman Band and all that, so... I mean, are, are some of those older influences uh, really your, your base influences and, and, and when you're doing, you're writing your music? Um, I, I think the, the older influence is probably, is probably me, which is, which is Liam, the guitar player, more than, more than anybody. I mean, I'll, I, I, I like a lot of blues stuff and, and, and no, sort of, you know... Your blues show through. Yeah, I think it does come through in, in, in little, little, little bits and pieces in the solos and things. You know, it's kind of bluesy influence in places. Um, yeah. Well, yes, yeah, where it came from, you know, you know, everything was came, your Zeppelin and everything came came from the blues, pretty much. So, yeah. So, how did you guys come up with the name of the band Hell's Addiction, and who designed that album cover with the uh, skull and crossbones? And what was it, Matt? A motorcycle helmet, or what is that? I mean, it looks like to me, it looks like a Harley Davidson yeah, Harley motorcycle David. guy that just passed away and died with his helmet on. Yeah, yeah. I guess he was going too fast oh, yeah. listening to the new album. Maybe you or something? You didn't touch the helmet. Uh, skull and crossbones, the guy in mask, though. Yeah, I mean the logo for me was because the album was was so sort of straight ahead, sort of rock and roll. I, I said, the guys, we want some, we want something that looks sort of. You, say you, you go to a record store and you pick up a Motorhead album, right? And you look at the front cover and it's got it's, it's got their, their symbol on. You know exactly what you're going to get. And I think with, with our album, you look at it and you, you could do, you generally see, you go, that's got to be a rock and roll album, right? 
Yeah, and I said, that's what it is. I think that kind of said it all. And um, the name, I think Jason, the bass player, came on. He came with his running. Yeah, I think, I think he was out running. He, he just came up with a name and came. He said, yeah, we should probably call it Van House Addiction. And I was like, oh, right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Well, <laughs> at first, of course, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, a bit too heavy for us. Heavy name for the sort of musical play at the time. And I think once we it, it played a few gigs with it, and the song started progressing more. It works. It really works. Yeah, it fits. It fits. Well, all, yes. all I know is I'm going to see the CD cover and I go, exactly what you guys just said. I know what's going to be inside here. you got the skull, the crossbones, and hey, i got to check this stuff out. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's, the sort of, that's the sort of imagery that we wanted, you know. It's, I mean, we know we're not doing anything new. We know it's not original, but it's honest. And, and, that, and that's, you, you can tell that just from, just from seeing the album cover and you go, that's going to be a rock and roll album. Bang it on, that is a rock and roll album. Done and dusted, yeah. <laughs> no, no bullshit, just fucking. <laughs> yeah, straight ahead. Okay, so now we got the real important questions here on the Hard Rockology Show. We're talking with um, Hell's Addiction, Liam and uh, Luke from the band. Guys, uh, we need to know the beverage of choice. Beverage of choice. Mine the um, Old J rum oh. uh, with a little coke in it with a dash. Old J rum. I like uh, Jameson's Jameson's Irish whiskey. Um, Kraken crack and rum. Kraken's a good rum. Rum in general for me. Yeah, plenty great, of great nephew. Yeah, plenty of Guinness. Well, you know what? This is a band I could hang out with because yeah, this just... is like the first band we've had we've, we've had on the show that, that that didn't mention Jack Daniels. They mentioned rum and Guinness. Yeah, so I'm happy. I got my rum. I got my Guinness and a little Jameson. Yeah. So I'm good to go. So. Definitely needed that for a cocktail. Of good night. Yeah. Hey, we got some ideas for your merchandise because you only have the shirt up there right now on your website, right? Yeah, we've got to get some stuff sorted. Fire okay. away. Okay, so uh, I was working on some ideas for you guys. You need to get like a, a pint glass with Hell's Addiction on there. That'd be kind of cool. Okay. Got to get some women's t-shirts, some women's yep. uh, short shorts with Hell's Addiction stamped across the backside. You got to get oh, yeah. big bitch t-shirts. You got to get big bitch t-shirts. Big bitch t-shirts. That's that's right definitely, that's going to be a top seller with our shadow over there. Yeah. And you guys need like an ice chest with uh, Hell's Addiction stamped on it too. The official ice that's, chest that's of uh, Hell's Addiction. The first thing we're going to buy. <laughs> you got you to gotta keep the rum chilled, and you got to... Well, even Jameson Cold tastes great, too, so... Not to mention really? not to mention the Guinness, so... Yeah. All right. Oh, first concert you guys have been to, ever, is, uh, that made you want to be a musician? For me, actually, it was... Do you remember a little band called Matchbox 20? Uh, yeah, that was back, like, in the um, late 90s, early 2000s. That would have been, I saw, I saw them on the first tour, the first show they ever did over here in 1996, I think it was. All right, Max. What about you, Luke? Yeah. Uh, first, my, my first live gig I went to see was uh, System of a Down when they released Top Sister. I'm and sorry. I think uh, when the first, I was there, I just started, just started drumming at this point, and uh, I came in with a prison song, which I was just like, boom, <laughs> boom, and it kicked in like that, and watching him just look at the drummer there every time the lights flashed on, and then getting to kick into them, uh, like a mega rock song. Like that, that installed it in me from then on that I want to be on the stage rather than be down here. I think from when I, when I was a kid as well, like I used to, like my dad played in bands years and years ago, and my mum and dad used to drag me to like um, blues shows when I was like eight, nine, ten. And so I've, I've always just kind of been used to just watching, seeing, seeing great guitar players and watching bands and thinking, yeah, I'd love to be able to do that. Mm. That's quite cool to be able to do it. <laughs> so, guys, where can people find out about Hell's Addiction? Um, if, if they go on to uh, www.hellsaddiction.com, um, there's loads of information on there. I think you can, you can buy the merch from there. You can actually buy a physical copy of um, Rage Your Glass 2 that we'll, we'll post out to you. Um, and obviously, the merch, we're, we're going to jump on that and get that sorted as soon as possible to try and get sort of ladies' vests and various different things, pint glasses with uh, Hell's Addiction on. Rage Your Glass at the bottom when you finish it. Exactly, yeah. Um, Big bitch t shirts. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter. Um, you can find it everywhere, really. iTunes, Amazon, yeah. Okay, guys, one more question, and uh, I think that'll wrap it up. Uh, Spinal Tap moments so far being in the band. <laughs> Spinal Tap moments. Generally, generally, when we play live, the only thing that goes wrong is Luke his hits the drum kit so hard, it tends to fall to pieces. You'll turn around and see a cymbal, like, falling towards your face, so you have to be quite aware that at any moment you're going to get hit with a drumstick, a cymbal... <laughs> Or cowbell, or, or just just or just, uh, just general drum instruments. Yeah, depends on what happens. The drum gets slowly paces away because <laughs> there's an animal on the drums. That's why. I think I'm going to go see them live just to see that happen. Yeah, just as just as long as just. Trust me, it happens. <laughs>
Okay, guys, I want to thank you for uh, coming on the Hard Rockology show. And as we always do, we want to have you guys announce your next song and take us out of the segment, okay? Okay, this is Liam and Luke from uh, Hell's Addiction on Hard Rockology. Thank you for having us. And uh, this is our track, Brand New Story. Enjoy. <laughs> 